Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and on this edition of L'Chaim, I am so pleased to welcome back yet again one of my favorite scholars and teachers in the Jewish world who brings an unusual stand, understanding of the arc of Jewish history and the essence of the Jewish tradition to people who both are well-educated Jews or yet to be educated Jews. His name is Rabbi Ken Spiro. He's senior lecturer and researcher for Eish HaTorah in Jerusalem. He's the author of a number of outstanding books, including Crash Course in Jewish History, From Abraham and the Birth of Monotheism to the Holocaust and the Creation of Israel, World Perfect, The Jewish Impact on Civilization, and his most recent book, Destiny, Why Such a Tiny Nation Plays Such a Huge Role in History. Ken Spiro also is a superb tour guide licensed by the Israel Ministry of Tourism. And I've said it to you before, if you're planning a trip to Israel, you'd be very wise to think of Ken Spiro. Ken, thank you for once again sitting at this table. Wonderful to have you back. Thanks for having me. When we last spoke, we were speaking about so many things having to do with how views Jew, the, view the Jewish tradition, what the essence of the Jewish tradition is. Uh, at one point, we were talking about the, uh, the metaphor of this and this this being the relationship between man and God, this being the relationship between man and his fellow man, and how the Jewish tradition you know, obviously thinks this is critical, but that they connect it to this. And you and I were discussing the extent to which this is crucial to a person's this. And I believe your point ultimately was any individual may have this, but that if one looks over the period of time how civilizations evolve. For a civilization to retain a sense of this, there must be a sense that this comes in some way from the divine. Do I have it correct? Yes, exactly. And then we were talking about the extent to which, actually, I want to ask you two things. Number one, if you do acknowledge that there are individual Jews enormously committed to this, who might question even the very existence of God? Who might say to you, I, I'm happy that you believe in a God. I don't believe in a God. But I do believe that the Jewish tradition has a claim on us in terms of the profound wisdom it encompasses when it, had, when it talks about human relationships. To the, for the Jew who doesn't believe in God in that classic way, how do you relate personally to that God? What would you say to that, to, I'm sorry, to that individual? What would you say to that individual in terms of his commitment to not simply ethics, liberalism, no, 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 no. His commitment to Jewish peoplehood, commitment to a style of Jewish life that is halachic, a commitment to living, kashrut, brit milah, certainly Shabbat, Mm -hmm. but it would not be necessarily an orthodox commitment. What's your relationship to, and how do you respond to that Jew who you know you see all around you, not only in America, but uh, in a different nature, very much so in the state of Israel as well? How do you speak to that Jew? Right. So, I mean, I work for an organization, Eish HaTorah, the founder of Noah Weinberg, a blessed memory, was all about you know, reaching out to Jews who were not necessarily connected or educated Jewishly, again, to show them the beauty and the relevance. So number one thing, which is super important, uh, is basically being able to explain to that Jew who's not connected, maybe has a strong sense of social justice and, and this feeling this is what Judaism is about, to recognize that there's a lot in Judaism which might be viewed as ritual, or if they could took a fresh look or actually experience it, would realize it's something that greatly enhances 
their life, their pleasure, spirituality, whatever way they want to. Most people often look at God as the big guy upstairs with the club who wants to hit you if you do the wrong thing. That's not what it's about. Um, but that's one thing is to show them this is like keeping Shabbat. I was raised, you know, I always jokingly say we used to have ham and cheese on matzah. And I thought people who kept Shabbat were out of their minds. And someone actually showed me that, because it's all about, because you're thinking from the outside, I can't turn on a light, can I flush a toilet, you know? And then, now having kept Shabbat for longer than someone who hasn't kept Shabbat, I always jokingly say, even if I didn't believe in God, I'd still keep, I'd still keep Shabbat. Just have a day without a smartphone, because it's an incredible experience of just reconnecting, rejuvenating. You know, it's the time when my kids, we'd all read, we'd talk, we eat, we relax, no one's like fidgeting. It was so bad I was getting phantom vibrations on my hip from my phone that wasn't there. So that, well, that's one thing. That's the nice way to do it, number one. But it's an also, again, going back to the bigger view, because I always have the bigger view, to explain to such Jew that sure, you may not be connected to the big guy upstairs and you may see no necessity for that ritual and you may feel that what Jewish identity is best expressed as is a commitment to social justice. But again, just as an individual Jew who can say as an atheist can be a great human being, whereas a very religious Jew who keeps super glot kosher can be very unethical, I say that long term, there is ultimately no moral justification for what you believe to be right without that connection. And on a personal level, and a historical level, what Judaism proves is when Jews leave this stuff behind, which is that observance and learning, the study and the practice, um, this disappears, which is why there's no such thing as a fifth generation assimilated Jew. Eventually, they just opt out of Judaism, and they're gone. That, that's proven over okay. and over again. I wasn't clear enough. Yeah. And, I'm, and I mean this positively. I mean it kindly. I think you're so used to hearing a certain argument. You answered an argument I did not set okay. up for you. I did not talk about the Jew who says Judaism is social action. I feel badly for that Jew. I think there are streams of Judaism. I think there are aspects of liberal Judaism. Does it mean that if you talk to a liberal rabbi, he will espouse this? I think most reform rabbis, most conservative rabbis, mon most non-Orthodox rabbis would never say ritual doesn't count, observing Shabbat doesn't count, kashrut doesn't count. I think what, a, what many reform rabbis would say today is it doesn't count as much. And I don't know that that is antithetical to the Jewish tradition. I think there's something very Jewish about saying Kashrut matters a lot, but there are things that matter more. The Jew that I gave you, I want to hear you answer, mm -hmm. is not a social action Jew. It's a Jew who says, yes, I'm a non-Orthodox Jew, but I practice Judaism. I have a kosher home to some extent. I celebrate Shabbat on Friday night to some extent. I'm in the synagogue every Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. I have a Seder every Passover. I do not eat matzah, at least on the first two nights, maybe even all seven, maybe all eight. Chametz. Chametz. Yeah, I don't eat chametz. Right. I'm eating matzah. Right. Right. So that I'm talking about a Jew who is not an orthodoxly observant Jew, but a Jew who wants, who understands it's not about social action. That social action, by the way, is a term I believe. And I apologize to anybody if you feel differently. I respect your right to feel differently. I feel social action is a term that was devised when movements wanted to give Jews a sense that they could be Jewish without looking or feeling or acting like other more traditional Jews. It was a mistake. I will say parenthetically, and I'm, I, I will go on a digression with you for one moment. In our, first, our last meeting, you used the word tikkun olam. I know this is a battle I have lost already, but I will rail against tikkun olam as long as I can. How many times does tikkun olam appear in Pirkei Avot? How many? Zero. Zero. Does the phrase ever appear in the Torah? Zero. There are idioms 
of Likate, li, likate, li, likate, likate yeah. Olam yes. yeah. But there's no Tikkun Olam anywhere right. in the Talmud. It is not a rabbinic concept. <coughs> it's a concept that was developed, basically, it's a Kabbalistic concept that was used by liberal Judaism to find a term that meant social action. It is not intrinsically Jewish. More than that, you, who profoundly understand the differences between Judaism and Christianity, understand Jews are no longer to, re we're not here to repair a world that somehow human beings destroyed. We're here to improve a world that God gave us. And our task is to be the partners in the improvement of creation. Right. Jews talk about improving. They never talk about repairing. That's a Christian term. At the same time, that they, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, okay. more or less. Yeah. More or less. I'm sure much more than less. More than less, yes. for sure. And the problem is, you live in this world as well. But anyway, we come away, and the question becomes, how do you deal with, not the Jew who says to you, I'm a New York Times liberal Jew. I'm a Jew. I'm just not an Orthodox Jew. And my Judaism is not driven by a, an absolute belief that this is real. It may be real. And also, unless you're different than I am and different than Maimonides and different than most of the Jewish tradition, for you, this is real sometimes. And sometimes you doubt this is real. And I argue, doubting this is real is the ultimate Jewish stance. Doubting it's real is not saying it isn't real. And I don't care about somebody who says it's definitely real. Good, go ahead. I'm happy for you. I want to show Jews that saying, I'm not sure this is real. For, there are moments this is real for me, and there are moments it isn't. That's Judaism. Okay. First of all, that's how God designed us. Yes. You know, God, that we talked about the Yetzirah. Last time the, we saw You know, the, the uh, yes, this, the, it's that every human being has this side to them, which is put in by God. It's not like the Christian thing of the devil does the bad stuff and God does the good stuff, and sometimes the does devil Judaism wins. Judaism have a devil? There's an idea of an accusing angel. Judaism has no devil. There's no devil. Say it. There's no devil. There's no there, devil. The term Satan comes from the Satan, who's an angel who acts as a prosecuting attorney to point stuff out, usually what used allegorically. What power does Satan have over God? He has no power. God. There's no power. None. No power. We're, no. Not, we're not in a bifurcated yeah, universe yeah, where none of this, none source of, this of good against evil. None of this dualistic stuff. Right. The good and the bad is all from God. Right. And it's all about choices. Right. The Sahara is put in there to give us the ability to choose. Otherwise, we'd be automatons, like a machine doesn't choose. Even animals act on instinct. So human, be human beings have free will. They have free will. And the ultimate free will decision a person makes, the ultimate is to live with God or yes. not. And by the way, and I also disagree with you on this. We should have time last time. There are prof most Christians that I know, most American Christians, and most American Jews, uh, they're the same. They're the same. A Fairfield County Jew and a Fairfield County Christian, it, it, there's no difference between them. Neither of them knows their tradition. And they identify or not. But classically, the difference between Christianity and Judaism is cavernous. Cavernous yeah. in theology and ideology. And one of the caverns is free will yeah. or grace. Exactly. And, and you have taught this so profoundly that I want to make sure I'm on the Chaim. You're not misunderstood. There are many ways in which we now literally put our hands around our Christian brethren. And we are one. We are one. We are one larger community. But I don't ever pretend that, that classic Christian theology and classical rabbinic Judaism are the same. They are worlds apart. Absolutely. Okay. So when you talk about free will, and it's critical, the contrast is grace. In the Christian tradition, you don't do anything without grace. In the Jewish tradition, your free will is primary, and it comes from 
the decision between the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah And where does free will come? Where does the Yetzirah and the Yetzirah come no, they from? They both come from God. They come from God. The creations of God. Yes. But that, the big difference is it makes personal responsibility a much more central part of Absolutely. our identity than faith. Yes. Because it's all about what I believe, whereas Judaism, we always say it's deed versus creed. Yes. The notion that you could believe something and be evil, but you let Jesus into your heart, you know, and therefore you're saved. Judaism would say you can believe all the nice things you want, but you're judged on the actions because the actions are the expressions of the decisions you make when you use your free will. So 100% that the, the free will is a, is a huge issue. So that there's no like Satan, devil, the devil made me do it. It's never an argument you could use in, in a Jewish court when you stand before God. <laughs> Never work. What's the single greatest misunderstanding? I mean, you deal with this all the time. It's not fair in some way to make you speak to the greatest, but what the, just for fun, what's the greatest misunderstanding American Jews have, you find, when you speak all over America to groups of every movement? What's the biggest mistake? the most common mistake, or the one that pains you the most. You wish Jews didn't get this wrong. What is it? I think it's the most fundamental point of what, what does God want from us? I find that's the number one thing. I, I'm 100%. And it's interesting that, that I think many of the Orthodox and the non-religious world all often believe the same thing. Really? It, it, on, in different ways. It's we're going to be judged on, you know, in the Orthodox world, it's the extent that I keep the stringencies in halacha, Somehow that makes God happy. And in the, the secular non, or the non-Orthodox world, it's that God only cares about all that minutia and halacha that I do. That that's what being a good Jew is about. And it's kind of the same thing. It, it kind of is. And it's both, you know, like I said, God doesn't want anything from him. He, does, he wants us to be happy. He wants to have a relationship with us. He doesn't need us to do anything for him. He didn't give us, like a parent, you know, like when you, I remember when you're a little kid and you make your parent craft, like you make your dad a pencil holder. You know, like that your father needs that, you know. He keeps it because, you, and, and there's a great lesson in human beings. You know, when we give things to God, it's not for God, it's for us to learn to give. When a parent gives to a child, it's not because the parent needs it, it's the child needs to learn how to give. Because if the child, children are takers. The essence, one of the essence of growing up is to learn how to start giving back, take responsibility. When you're little, you're just all me, 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 you know. So, you know, whatever you giving, doing for God is really for you. So it makes you, he doesn't need anything from us. But I think both parts of the Jewish world actually often get that wrong, that somehow God needs something from us. I don't Again, the non-Orthodox Jew says what God needs. That it's, that, that it's all, that being Jewish is all about that stuff that I need to do so that I don't get zapped for not doing what God wants me to do. Like he's this really overbearing father with extremely high standards who's a perfectionist who obsesses on minutia. And meanwhile, and, and also, that it, and this is also not a Jewish idea, that it, it's all about being that kind of holy, that's that stuff, and it's, it's no fun. Judaism is no fun. And by the way, I think that's also in a lot of the Orthodox world. It's, you can't have fun. Fun is bad, you know. I know it sounds harsh, and some Orthodox Jews are going to watch this and go, what's he talking about? But there's a lot of asceticism in the Orthodox world today. A lot of people not participating in the physical world in a luckily permissible way that is another great example of Kiddush Hashem. That religious Jews can have fun is a very important thing to demonstrate to people. You know, maybe life, we should start with some sportswear for the ultra-Orthodox world. Your life is supposed to be devoted to studying Torah. But it's, that's where it comes there's from. There's a famous piece of Talmud where God questions, if you didn't see the world I made and taste all the beautiful foods that's I made, right. he doesn't want you just to have cholent your whole life. You know, <laughs> it's, about ex it's about experiencing that world in the correct way, but getting out and experiencing it. You know, the rabbis say, there's a lot of interesting discussions, say, Derech Eretz Kadma LeTorah, that being a good human being comes before learning of the Torah. Or ain't kemach ain't Torah. If you can't make a living, you're not going to be able to learn. There's all kinds of, it's again about that balance. Or the famous statement of, if all you're doing, Maimonides talks about this a lot. He says, the unique power of Torah is it brings you to action. But that Torah without action is lost. You know, if you just sit in a room and study how to be a righteous human being, but you never get out of your house and do anything righteous, you're not going to be a righteous human being. It's all about, you know, like we say, you have to take what you know, place it in your heart, because when you feel something, you act on it, but then you have to live it. You don't just have to know it, you've got to live it. And that's the proper balanced Jew, in my opinion. 
You mentioned before deed over creed. Explain what you mean. That Judaism ultimately, because we're judged by the free will, what's the expression of free will? Decisions. Decisions are always expressed in actions. In Judaism, having a bad thought might not be great, but you're not held accountable for thinking something bad. It's when your thought leads you to an action. You're not held responsible for something you think. Thoughts, are not, you, you, it doesn't lead to any action. You didn't hurt anyone. And it's a some, Jew is, is free to think or dream anything. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you shouldn't be because it might lead you to do something in the wrong but direction. But it doesn't lead but you. But no, you're not held accountable for your thoughts. First of all, you have, you have a Yetzirah. Things are going to pop into your brain. The essence, that's really where it begins. You know, it says, Sof ma'aseba The end is action. The beginning is thought. Thoughts pop into our mind all the time. The way to deal with thinking is not by keeping any, you know, if you never get exposed to anything because you might have a bad thought because you're afraid you can't deal with it, that makes you a kind of a weak human being, in my opinion. That's another issue I see in the religious world of being so afraid of seeing anything because it makes, when you do see it, the extreme is so, you know, if you never saw ice cream and then you see ice cream, it's like, oh my God, if you work in an ice cream store, you walk in every day, ice cream, no big deal. But that's how it works. There's something to be said for that shutting everything out to the extent that you, you don't learn how to deal with it in, in, a, in a normal way anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's all about what you do. It's all about the actions. And speak about it in the context of sexuality and the power of sexual tension. And it's interesting, sexuality, which is celebrated in the Jewish tradition, is also associated with the Yetzir Hara. But what are you allowed to think and what are you allowed to do in terms of sexuality in the Jewish tradition? Again, this is a great example between the Christianity, like for instance, and it's, like I said, I've mentioned this previously, that sexuality is, is a very powerful drive. It's one of the most powerful drives there is in this world. Um, and it's, it's neutral. It, it, it's all how you use it. By the way, Judaism, again, without going to details, is very open. If you actually study the Jewish sources within the confines of a, of a legally binding relationship of marriage I'm talking about, it's not a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions with the hole in the sheet and all these things that people hear, all nonsense. which are all nonsense. nonsense and have no basis. As a matter of fact, what people don't realize is as part of the marriage contract, a man has a legal obligation to satisfy his wife on a physical level and not to do so is grounds for a divorce and the, the, the woman can divorce the man. It doesn't go the other way, which I find quite interesting. So Judaism recognizes the sexual drive is not only a vital part of relationship, there's nothing negative about it. It's not something, oh, we're just, it's okay, we'll let you do it because you're weak, but it's actually right. within the correct relationship where there's responsibility. It's not just using someone, which is what marriage is about in a marriage contract, that you're, you're not just using someone and dumping them or abusing them and hurting them. Then by all means, and it's something that you have an obligation towards, actually. And if you do it right, it only makes that relationship on an emotional and spiritual level that much deeper. And there's a lot in Kabbalah that is very sexual on a very deep level, talking about things that people don't generally study. But it's all in there because many of the story, like the Song of Songs, which is one of the two books in the Bible where God's name isn't mentioned, it's actually a love poem, which is fairly, fairly graphic, often changed when it's, when it's translated into English to... But it, on the deepest level, it, it's talking about, it's sure, that, you know, we say it's a relationship between God and the Jewish people, but spirituality, sexuality on the deepest level is often con is considered to be very spiritual. It's also and a it's, metaphor. And, yeah, and it's, it's a, a very, metaphor. very high level of connection, which is not something that's supposed to be shut to the side, but something that's supposed to be developed in the proper context and only elevates and fulfills you and, you know, makes you more connected and the world more connected. Are you allowed to lust? After your wife, for sure. Other people's wives, you're not supposed to. <laughs> Only if you act on it. Yeah, again, you're not. You're, you're allowed to lust yeah. all you. And that's your point about you're allowed to dream and think anything. What you're not allowed to do is act on yeah, it. Yeah, for sure not. Acting on it is always the big problem. Thoughts will always creep into our minds. You're allowed to have a racist thought? Everyone has racist thoughts. Right. The question Everyone is, what do you want does. social policy to do and be, and what would you do? It's yeah. not whether uh, you ever have a ra But that's the Eight Sahara. The Eight Sahara is always going to be throwing these things at you, because if you didn't lust after women, you would not have no, any libido. If you didn't have libido, right. you wouldn't procreate. Right. So it's all, it's a very interesting story in the Talmud about after the men of the Great Assembly, which is that expanded Sanhedrin, 
that existed between the destruction of the first and second temple, they decided that you know in the future, because the, the relationship with God was going to be weakened, maybe they should like lower the drive on certain things. Yes. And they got it's one of the most esoterically yeah, it, wild stories where they get together and they they, they, they realize idolatry because the connection to God is weaker, but if the connection to idolatry stays strong, people might just d strain to idolatry and lose their connection to God. So they, they weaken that. They draw out the, this wild story. They draw out the Yetzer Har, the evil inclination for idolatry, and they pluck a hair, and it gives this. I have no idea what this story is talking about, but they managed to somehow lower that desire. Then they said, hmm, we're all together in the room. Maybe we should do the, another big stumbling block is sexuality. And they said, we'll lower that one. And they said they did that, and then all the animals stopped mating. So they said, we're going to return that to that level, and we'll leave the idolatry one down. Which, by the way, is much of the world today, where the licentiousness is still floating around. The spirituality seems to be in a lower level. But it's all part of that Yetzirah. And to mess with it is a very unusual thing. It's the only story I know in the Talmud we talk lovely. about. There's another Midrash that says that one day God said, OK, I will eliminate the Yetzirah because you're asking me to. And on that day, not one chicken laid an egg. Yeah. And that was that. Exactly. And they said, no, I'll no, put it back. Exactly. Yeah. Same, same idea. Yeah. That it's that, it's that temptation and the drive that, that, that leads us to the... Do you remember the movie Never on Sunday? No. There was a movie Never on Sunday with Melina McCurry. And the reference was that on Sunday, you don't have sex. That's the Lord's Day. That's the day when the Holy Ghost is in the house. And it would be inappropriate to have sex in front of the Holy Ghost. And not even having seen the movie, I would guess that that's the day when the temptation was the greatest. <laughs> and what's the Jewish response to sex on Shabbat? It's considered the holiest time. Friday night was specifically considered a time. It's when, part of the mitzvah yeah, exactly. of Shabbat. I mean, there is a marvelous Jewish embrace of life here which most Jews don't know, Ken. Exactly, exactly. All right, I, I want to come back to a, a question you and I have sort of dealt with before, but I want to hear how you would answer it. In your mind, you said before, it's not that God wants things from us. That's sort of even silly to talk about in those terms. Does God intervene in human history given your emphasis on free will. Yeah, absolutely. How? But that, you're dealing with, by the way, the ultimate question. The one, I know. Because I always explain it as, you know, the big, one of the big, you know, the big, the biggest question in the essence of what Kabbalah is, I'm not a mystical teacher, is the relationship between the Ein Sof, the infinite, and us. You know, how can we even exist? You know, if God is infinite, there's no parts of infinity, but all the good philosophical questions that exist, you know, if God is all-powerful, all-good, and all-knowing, why is there evil? If God knows and controls everything, how can you say we have free will? You know, maybe we're just scripted into a book, like the character. Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book called Breakfast of Champions, and in the middle of the book, the author goes down to meet the main character. And the main character thought he was a guy in the world, and he realizes he's scripted into a book, and he has a complete existential breakdown. So how do, we, how do we understand this? It's not a simple, you're asking a very profound question. There's no simple answer, but 100%. Oh, yeah. I want you to know, for me, it's very simple. The creation says the world always follows its natural course. God has promised us free will. God promised Noah he would never again destroy because of man's evil. For me, it's, for me, it's not a problem. For me, the answer, the Jewish tradition's answer is... The way in which God influences the world is through you and your connection to God. And if you're nachshon, you're propelled into that sea. And when you enter the sea, only then does the sea split. It's all metaphor. For me, the Jewish tradition teaches, even for those of us who have this, this is what drives human goodness. But God will never suspend the laws of nature, not to heal someone who's sick because somebody prayed to him while in the bed right next to him, there's nobody praying and God says, no, too bad, I can't, I can't save you. There's no Jewish God who does that. 
and I don't believe there's any Jewish God who watched the Holocaust and consciously decided, for whatever reason, it has to happen. And you know that there are Orthodox groups who believe the Shoah is the result of Jewish assimilation in Germany. That just as God brought Babylonia to destroy, Assyria, uh, to destroy Judah and brought Assyria to destroy Israel, God brought Hitler to punish bad Jews. I find all of this to be vile, un-Jewish, antithetical of the Jewish tradition. And although I know it's, there's something nice about saying on an emotional level, yes, God every now and then does something to save. I don't find it anything authentic in the Jewish tradition outside of the emotional component. Now, the Jew says to me, I have a relative who's very ill. Rabbi Golub, will you pray for him? The answer is, of course. If there's somebody in pain, I don't teach, I don't want to go into the philosophy of the Jewish tradition. But when I'm talking to you on Lechayim, outside of pain, the answer is, in the Jewish tradition, the way God intervenes is not what normally people mean, that God suspends the laws of nature to save. God never, the Jewish God, never does that. What I want to know from you is, in the 19th century, in the 18th century, yeah. in the 11th century, in the Crusades, in the Black Plague, in the blood libel, in Nazi Germany, in Ma'alot, right. God said, okay. So, I mean, the big overarching, without going to the specifics of each case, number one, mainstream Jewish traditional thought was nothing happens in history that's not the ruts on Hashem, as they say. The, one of the great, the, the will of God, so to speak. There's there, the notion that anything can happen without God knowing about it is antithetical to the Jewish idea that God knows and controls everything. Okay, so the, so the Holocaust is God's right zone. No, 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 no. Okay. To, no, no. I need, that's, that's the beginning of the answer. The way I explain it, without going to any specific story, Holocaust, Crusade, Ma'alot, is that all of human history, the way I understand that Judaism explains it, is this incredible interaction between God's all-knowing and all-powerfulness and our free will. He gives us a world to act in. We, the way I, I use this analogy where, you know, we have a journey to go on. And I always use an analogy of a guy who has six days to make it through 60 miles of forest to get to the top of this mountain. And there's a host to the scenario who says, here's the deal. You know, there's a lot of different trails you can go down. Some are easy, some are hard, some are long, some are short. You know, you decide, you'll make it. I guarantee we can rescue at any time. You'll get there, but the nature of the journey is up to the decisions you make. So the way I say it in the most general way is what's in the past is in the past. The end is guaranteed. The journey is up to the decisions we make. And, and there will always be, if something needs to happen, God, we, we have a contractual, on a Jewish understanding, we have a contractual relationship with God. It's the most oft-repeated idea in the Torah. We say it in the Shema, in the second paragraph. If you listen, God says, look, your great-grandfather Abraham, he signed a deal with me. It's a no-brainer, straightforward. You keep your side of the bargain, I keep mine. What is your side of the bargain? You have a good relationship with me and with each other, and you do that Kiddush Hashem. Then I will make sure that, that things go smoothly for you so you can accomplish that mission. But because, like the hero in my book, the, your role is now completely central because you made that choice. If you veer from that, there are huge consequences. That means someone's going to come along and, and, and give you a big smack if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing in this world. You can't escape that responsibility. So God's not standing back and saying, I created the world, and, and now you navigate your way through it, and good luck, and maybe we'll see at the end. There is an interaction on some level, but human free will is always involved in the story. There's a lot of interesting stories in the Talmud about an emperor who fires arrows in four different directions, and they all end up going towards Jerusalem. And he realizes that, that he's trying to be used to punish the Jewish people for something they were doing wrong, and they had to get a message. He says, I don't want to be part of that, because every human being has the free will to say, I don't want to do that. Just like there's a very famous one of the commandments says you've got to build a railing around the top of your house. It's one of the 613. You have a roof that has access. Pen yipel anofel. No Lest the one who's going to fall falls from your roof. Meaning this guy, because of something he did, it's going to end badly for him. But you don't want to be the instrument to make that happen. So it's this incredibly 
complicated interplay between God's will and giving us the free will to make decisions, and on the Jewish level, that, that arrangement, with that, that responsibility and that agreement we have with him, and how that plays out in history based on the decisions we make. So there is a constant interaction. What I don't, I agree with 100%, to make statements like, because the reform movement in Germany caused the Holocaust is ridiculous. First of all, unless you have a prophet who has direct connection to God, how do you know that? And then you could ask the obvious question. Jews in Germany had several years to get out. They didn't get destroyed to the same level that all the religious Jews in Poland got wiped out on. What happened there? How do you explain that one? They're the ones who got caught in, in uh, 1939 with the German invasion of Poland. So to, to, to that kind of stuff, and I remember a rabbi said with Ma'alot, that, or not Ma'alot, there was a train that hit a bus full of kids, and he made a statement that it's because of lack of Sabbath observance. Stuff like that is outrageous. You, you, until we have someone who actually has a direct connection to the creator of the universe, who can give us the insider scoop, and no such person exists that I know of today, that, that kind of stuff we can't say. It's not that we don't know. For you to say, you know, we, how do we know? There's no prophet. It makes, Ken, it makes it sound like Ken says, well, you know, if a prophet came and told me, then I'd believe it. It's not, you're trying to, by the way, the problem I worry that Jews have, I don't know you well enough to know whether this is your problem, but I am associating with you with this problem. You're very committed. You're committed in the most wonderful way to, and to trying to explain to Jews what this covenant is all about. And that's what you're talking about when you say, we made an agreement with God through Abraham. And the covenant says, again, in one way or another, God, God says, if you do X, Y, and Z, I will be your God. That's how the Torah sets it up. And then the question is, if that's true, and God says, I'll protect you. I'll give you rain. And by the way, it said more than once in the Torah, and if you go astray... I will curse you, and you'll have no rain, and I will bring your enemies in to destroy you, and I will exile you for 400 years. This God does not play around in the Torah. And the question is, what do modern Jews like you make of that theology? I argue that if you read rabbinic Judaism, while they have this notion of the covenant, they have redefined it in, in such a way that never is it God's fault. That it's always about whether a Jew chooses to be Nachshon or not. Does a Jew do everything he possibly can in relationship to this to do that? And when Jews don't do that, there are consequences, not from on high, but because human beings create chaos, it's going to have blowback. And sometimes the Jew is the victim of other people's problems. And it's not God's responsibility or God's fault to step in and change history by intervening in, in nature. The laws of nature are immutable. They come from God. And one of those, if you're a mean person and no one stops you, you'll get meaner. And the real, the real culprit is not God in the Shoah, it's humanity in the Shoah. And the culprit, when the train hits, hits the bus, it's just, the tradition is clear. Nature itself is amoral. It's not immoral, but it's amoral. Yeah. Accidents happen. It's not God's fault, nor was God supposed to, at the last moment, whack that train some way and keep it from hitting the kids. It doesn't work that way. That's not what our tradition teaches. And you're now caught in, in, a, in a bind because you're committed to this notion. This notion that? That God said he would protect. And that's not what it was meant to be. And so when you say... You know, uh, the real reason is, the uh, reason I can't tell you yes or no is, I'm not a prophet. No, it's not reason. The reason is, you know, every Jewish fiber in you knows. No God sent that train to hit that kid. And no Holocaust happened because Jews were in some way not Jewish enough in Germany. Yep. So, <laughs> Mark, you always, you always go there. <laughs>
if I could keep all of what you just <laughs> said in my brain and try and explain it <laughs> in, a, in a way I think is sort of combines both. That idea in the Torah about the contractual agreement has to do with the responsibility we have. The byproduct of us not doing our side of the deal is all of that evil is going to come into the world. And that's really the issue. And that's where we, we, I think we are 100%. Because, Absolutely. Because the best way, you know, sometimes the quote I love when I want to summarize, you know, the Holocaust specifically or evil in general, is a quote by Rabbi Chaim of Volozhin, who founded the Volozhin Yeshiva in the early 19th century. And it's so beautiful because re it really pulls it all together, what we're both really saying. He said, when Jews don't make Kiddush, Gentiles make Havdalah. And it doesn't mean literal. You know, Kiddush is the ceremony on Friday night. But he's talking about exactly the contractual agreement we have with God, as I talk about all the time, is Kiddush Hashem. It's to bring values into the world. Nature abhors a vacuum. You know, it's a nature. the world will be full of one thing or another. Human beings are not essentially good or essentially evil, but if the world isn't full of the values that we committed through our relationship with God to bring into the world, and, those, and we're not proactively pushing those values in the world, the world will be full of the opposite values. Those opposite values will come into the world, and we, by the way, will be the first target of them, which is why you can pretty much tell how, when a, how a country treats Jews or Israel, how that country is doing in terms of its ethics and its morality. But bottom line is it's our responsibility because that's the agreement. And basically what's God saying, I think we actually jive very nice on this, is you do your job. You won't need me to do anything. I'm not going to supernaturally, but if you don't, you've now put yourself in a spotlight, in a unique position of responsibility, which the human race even subconsciously is aware that you have, which is why that crazy double standard, you know, Jews is news, as Charles Krauthammer used to say, or the fact that the UN will do 27 condemnations a year and 21 of them be against Israel. On the deepest level of collective human consciousness, the world is aware for thousands of years that we committed to a unique responsibility to be a light to nations and bring values into this world. And if we don't do that, the opposite will happen and the opposite will target us first. And that's what God's really telling us. He's not saying, you know, you just keep really kosher and no one's going to mess with you and it's going to rain your crops. Go, no, you have to proactively do that job because you put yourself, you chose a responsibility, not a privilege, not to be members of a unique club, a unique responsibility, and by virtue of that, you know, you shirk that responsibility. The consequences are huge for the world and especially gonna directly impact you in whatever period of time you're living in. Oh, I'm so proud of myself. Because that was a brilliant, that's a, that was a brilliant articulation. And you talked about the vacuum that when People don't do good enough. A vacuum is going to be filled by evil. Isn't that what you said? Yeah. Yes. And you have modified what you're saying just a little bit so that, yes, now you and I, I think now we're exactly the same. Because I had never said it in that idiom, and I think that is a beautiful expression of it. When people don't do good, they create a vacuum that evil fills. And that that's the way God set up the world. The extent to which God set up the world, that's the way God set up the world. And God wants human beings, human beings, to fill the vacuum with goodness. Human responsibility is, and I'll now come back to the way we almost began this, this conversation together. It's not about tikkun olam. It's about improving the world. And as you look right now at you know, Jewish life, theology aside. You look at Jewish life here in America, and you look at Jewish life in Israel. And Jewish life in Israel is also in danger. What is it that you think could energize the Jewish, the Jew, here in America and in Israel, who see themselves as secular, who don't see themselves as fundamentally Jewish, I've had, I've had Israelis recently here who are in various Israeli TV shows. Mm -hmm. I asked them, are you a Jew who happens to live in Israel? Are you an, are you an Israeli who happens to live in Israel? They're all Israeli. Yeah. They're, it's not like they don't understand what I'm asking, but for them, they're people of the world. You know, it's the universalism particularism. And I guess that's where I want to sort of wind up with you. Talk a little bit about what troubles you about the universalism argument as opposed to the particular 
And again, what would you want both American Jewry and Jewry in Israel to be more sensitive and committed to? Right. So, you know, when I'm talking about this topic, I say the world is more or less split. We Jews believe, by the way, because of the central role we play, we're like a model for the world. If we're not balanced, the world's not going to be balanced. And if you're following world politics, certainly American politics, the last few presidents, and the world is really seesawing. And it's not like a seesaw that's rocking less and less. It seems to be rocking more extreme between these two universal versus particular roles. The universal role is associated with the left. You know, it's about caring for the world, the brotherhood of man. Um, the particular world is about preserving my identity. And, and by the way, the extremes of both are not good. Extreme universalism leads to uh, basically whole countries losing their identities, believing that identities are evil, like and somehow, or, or these sort of holistic political ideologies such as communism where the, uni where the, in the individual is negated almost. Um, and extreme particularism leads to xenophobic racism. It's all about, you know, who I am, my skin color, or whatever, that kind of thing. So you have this tremendous, and we've seen that historically it's gone from one to the other. Europe, by the way, in the 18th and 19th centuries was very into the universal, like Schiller in the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, all dimension, verderbud, and all men are brothers. And what do you get as a reaction? Boom, you get the hypernationalism that leads to World War I. And then you get Nazism out of that. So we get boom, boom, because it's about that balance, exactly. And we see now the world has moved back with the 60s and everything. You know, it's moved back towards the universal worldview. And the belief being the less differences, I always say my, the worst, my favorite, least favorite song in the world is John Lennon's Imagine. Me too. I love it, but it's so antithetical to, first of all, reality I and hate Judaism. it. But it's such a great song. It's a nice it's song. It's a great song. It's a horrible it's, message. Exactly. Exactly. We, we, we see 100% eye to eye on that. Zev Magain wrote a book called John Lennon and the Beatles. He's a left-wing Israeli journalist, and he uses a great example. He said that, he said, no woman wants to be told by her husband that he loves her the way he loves every other woman. It's the nature of being human that That's you need to feel answer. special. That's very good. Yeah, you need to feel special. But special doesn't mean better. Special means uniqueness. We all need to feel all these anti-utopian novels and stories and books, are, even in Auschwitz, it's all about being a number with no name. Losing your identity means losing your individuality, means losing your value, which means you're disposable. So that extreme is no good either. So, but, but if you go to the Jewish world, you know, the, the, the non-Orthodox Jewish world tends to be focused on the universal thing, which is expressed, we've been talking about this model. <laughs> That's the mitzvahs, the commandments between men and fellow human beings, the social justice stuff. The Orthodox world tends to have moved towards the particularist side which is the commandments between us and God, kashrut, shabbat, which tend to have much more to do with preserving Jewish identity and separating Jews out. So the question is, is what's the Jewish perspective? And the answer to me is a no-brainer that it's both. It's, it's, it's absolutely, it's all about balance that we have. Are they equal? They're, they're, they are equal, and I would say, by the way, that is a much rabbinic source to be given to the fact that if you don't know how to behave this way properly, this way ain't going to work which is why the rabbis say things like Derech Eretz Kadma Torah that you got to first be a mensch. you got to be a decent human first being. First be a mensch. Yeah, you got to so first be. So they're not equal. Now, I'd say, I would say, if, if I always tell people, like I say, I say it's more important what goes out of your mouth than what you put in your mouth. But so they're not mean, equal. They're not equal. They're not, they're not equal. equal. They're not equal. And by the way, Ken Spiro says so. The Jewish tradition doesn't make them equal. This takes precedence over this if there's a conflict. What we want is to live with this without conflict. Yeah, the, the, be balanced, exactly. But if there's a conflict, this in the Jewish tradition, not to you, not to me, to Talmudic, Rabbinic Judaism, this always takes yeah. precedence. Yes? Yeah, because generally speaking, assuming you're not violating a significant prohibition, there is plenty of wiggle room that will prevent you from alienating or insulting or embarrassing your fellow human being because you're being very strict this way. And I've seen much too much of this People, you know, I don't want to go into details now. It's not constructive, but I've seen way too much of that. But, um, th but you think about it. I the analogy I always use is Kohanim. In the Jewish world, there's tribes, and then there's the Kohanim, who are a subgroup, who are a tribe of Levi. They have their own stringencies. A family of Levi, not yeah, a tribe. It's, but yeah, it's originally a family, but it's, it's, it's a, a subgroup within the tribe of Levi, correct. but it's a family. But they have, uh, Kohanim have additional stringencies that other, the rest of the Jewish people don't Correct. have. They all have to keep kosher and Shabbat, but they have more stringencies about coming into contact with impurity and who they can marry. So they are part, an intrinsic part of the Jewish people, but they are on a higher level. 
And before Mount Sinai, out of God's mouth comes one of the most beautiful lines. He says about the Jewish people, we're mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh, that we're a nation of priests and a holy people, that just as kohanim preserved their, their higher level of sanctity within the Jewish people, which, by the way, also had to preserve their tribal differences, but recognize they're part of one giant people. So it's the balance, even in the Jewish people as a whole, universal particular tribes versus the whole of Klal Yisrael, Jewish people. So too the Jewish nation, and this is the lesson for the social justice assimilated non-ritualistic Jews, this stuff keeps you separate. Kashrut Shabbat is beautiful, by the way. It's not just about being separate. What you eat affects you. Shabbat is amazing. But it does give you an awareness and a consciousness of your Jewishness, and it creates certain barriers between you and the non-Jewish world. It doesn't mean you can't talk to non-Jews and stuff like that, but you've got to be aware. You have to maintain a certain level of particularism, but you have to remember that you have this obligation towards your fellow Jews, first of all, and towards the rest of humanity. And you absolutely must have that balance. What I've been, I say this all the time, the problem is, is that much of the Orthodox world is hyper-focused on this, has lost sight of that. And even in the, in the Orthodox world, a lot of the outward kindness they're doing is within their own community. You know, the laws of charity are, of course, you have to help. You, you know, your mother needs $10 or your neighbor, you give to your mother first. Okay, so you have to help your neighbor first, and the Jewish people is your first priority in charity, but you have responsibility towards the rest of the world, because if you don't do that, you don't make kiddush, they're going to make havdalah. You have to remember that. It's also because you want to do that. You want to fix the world. That's what gives Jews, like as we say in Yiddish, geschmach. It makes them happy to do that. Stop saying fix. No, exactly. You yeah. got to get. You, you, yeah, you I need stop improve. It. Improve. Your improve. language has got to say because you say it so well. It's very important. We're here to improve the world. Improve, improve. But what I would say to this, that the Israeli who says maspik she an yes. Israeli, I'm Israeli, or in, is a recognition, and, and again, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. I have no problem saying this to an entire audience of black-hatted yeshiva guys. If those guys don't want to be like you, it's your fault because you're not showing them by interacting with them and living with joy how great it is that you're you and how beautiful. And it's not about fear, the fear factor of I'm going to get zapped if I eat a hot dog that isn't kosher enough, but it's about how much Judaism enriches me and how much I want to share that as a Jew is connected this way with you. And, 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 but, but, those, but those Jews, whether they be Israelis or secular Jews, what the, the problem is, and it's not their fault, Jewish law is very clear that a person who knows has a higher level of accountability than a person who doesn't know. If, if the Jewish world, if I always say, if, if, if Meir Sharim, which is the ultra-Orthodox part of Jerusalem, was doing what it was supposed to be doing on the highest level, people would walk in that neighborhood and walk out the other side and want to join. I don't want to talk about what happens when you go in there nowadays. Unfortunately, that's, it's not the most welcoming place. And that's really because they're so afraid of that outside influence, because they have so little confidence. You have to recognize we got a great product. We're the world's most successful business, family business ever on every level, and we're still going strong. You know, Mark Twain said, we saw them all, we beat them all. And we've changed the world in ways that are so profound, it's unbelievable. And we just have to recognize that we have an amazing, unbeatable product. And we, and we have to stop being so on the defense and really go on the offense. And when I say offense, I don't mean coercion and, you know, and, and forcing. I never believe in that stuff. I think it's the worst thing, especially with Jews. You push a Jew, they push back. You know, it's never going to work that way. But when you got something good, you know, they say imitation is the highest form of flattery. I always say that's the shortest class. You can get on Christianity and Islam. You know, if we didn't have a product that was so positive and beautiful, these offshoot religions would never have come into being. But we were offering something the rest of the world didn't have. We still have it. We just have to get it out there. And we need to show that Israeli that it's not about just, you know, dressing a certain way and eating a certain kind of food, but it's about living a certain lifestyle, which is just that much more connected and beautiful on every level. And, and you can be part of that. And we want you to be part of that and share it with you to whatever level you're willing to do it. At whatever speed you want to go, we're going to do that with you. We're not measuring success by... You know, you know, I always say it's like a ladder. What's wrong, you're wrong is your business. It's just that you're moving up on some level. But that responsibility, and I have no problem saying this to Orthodox audiences, always begins with religious Jews. So to make statements about how non-religious Jews misbehaving is causing these problems in the world, I'm sorry. This, it, I, I believe 100%. Reb Noach Weinberg, Rosh Hashiv, used to quote this piece of Talmud, which was very heavy, about when... God is going to destroy the temple. He tells the angels, go and put marks on the heads of the righteous people because I want to save them. And they'll get saved. The rest, will, you know, Jerusalem's destroyed. They're gone. 
So the accusing angel, he says, what do you mean? Those were the guys who had the obligation to tell everyone else to get their act together. And God says, and it's such a great line, he goes, but I know because I'm God, I'm outside of time, they wouldn't have listened anyway. And the accusing angel says, yeah, but they didn't even try. And God says, you're right, go put marks on their head, I'm going to kill them first. That's like a very heavy, that's very heavy. But the point is, is that, you know, according to your level of responsibility is your level, you know, and knowledge is your level of accountability. That's a very clear concept in Judaism. And that's the call to action to the religious world. I don't, not faulting an assimilated Jew that he's disconnected and doesn't want to visit Israel and doesn't support Israel and doesn't want to learn about Judaism. It's because no one's reached out to him and showed him what he's missing. It's like being blind your whole life and never have had, if you, if you had sight, you would know what you're missing. So we got that great product. We just got to get it out there. You are fabulous. I love you so much. You. And I, I am so glad that there are times that you stop by and we just get to talk. Uh, I've told you this off camera. I'm going to tell you on camera because I want you to, to, I want it to be a burden on you. You should be on JBS all the time. You should have your own show on JBS. You should be teaching all the time. The gift you have is a gift from heaven. And there are rabbi rabbis. That's who you are. So yeah, one more time. Yasha Koach. Kol tu Thank you. And we'll Thanks keep meeting me. as often as we possibly can. Amen. Rabbi Ken Spiro, a fabulous teacher of all things Jewish. I've mentioned his books before. I want to mention them again. A Crash Course in History, World Perfect, The Jewish Impact on Civilization, and destiny. Why such a tiny nation plays such a huge role in history? It's published by Geffen Press. Every single one of them should be in your home library. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed either by Ken or by me. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. And if you want to be in touch with Ken Spiro yourself, email me and I will forward, forward your emails on to him. Also, please remember that you can listen to us anytime, anywhere you go on podcast. L'chaim is now a podcast. Wherever you download podcasts, you will find L'chaim. Take us with you. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.